So just by way of introduction, many of you will already know, but just for those who don't, my name is Fiona Devine and I'm Professor and Head of Alliance Manchester Business School here at the University of Manchester. So today we are joined by Nadia Papa Nikhali, Professor of Information and Decision Sciences here in the business. As part of our original thinking series, we hear from new and recently promoted professors from across the business school as they deliver their inaugural lectures. It's great to see so many colleagues here to support Nadia. And of course, we do also welcome an online audience from across the globe who are also joining us. Thank you for coming along to today's event, wherever it is that you happen to be coming from. Now, Nadia's research focuses on the complexities and ramifications of decision making in business. Her research has two primary strands building explainable decision support tools and exploring the effect of individual characteristics on the decisions customers make. Nadia draws from a wide variety of disciplines and factors in her research, from decision theory to behavioral psychology. Today's talk, though, focuses on another key area of Nadia's work, and one of which is becoming increasingly crucial in the world of business and beyond, namely artificial intelligence. In this talk, entitled From Chernobyl to Chats, GPT, Decision Making in the Age of AI, Nadia will look at the array of challenges facing decision makers today and how decision aiding and AI powered tools can be utilized in the decision making process processes in order to enhance efficiency and effectiveness. This sort of course is an extremely important topic and one I'm sure that we're going to be hearing very much about over the next few years. Nadia's work on this subject has seen her lead several prominent research projects and receive funding from bodies including the ES, EPSRP, Innovate UK and the Alan Turing Institute. Indeed, she has recently been appointed to the Turing Research Ethics Panel. Nadia plays a key role in a number of UK and US professional analytic societies and has been elected to several leadership positions in the field. She is chair of the Decision and Outlets Group, which runs under the auspices of the UK Operational Research Society. She is the treasurer of the Multiple Criteria Decision Making Section of Informs, a leading US management scientist society. And she is also a member of the Informs Decision Management Society. Finally, Nadia is a founding committee member of Warren, which is Women in OR and Analytics, and chair of this mentoring subcommittee. Now, there will, as ever, be plenty of time for the end of today's session for your questions. And those in the room can raise their hands in the traditional way. And for those of you who are online, type your question into the chat function at the bottom of your screen, and we will integrate those into the event as it goes along. Now, the discussion and questions today will be facilitated by Simon French, who is an emeritus professor at ABS and who has himself made numerous contributions to the field of decision analysis and has published a number of books on the subject too. Simon joined the business school back in 1999 and was head of the business systems division as it was then for several years before retiring from full-time work in 2011. He then worked part-time at the University of Warwick until 2020 for most of that time leading their external consultancy group. Simon is now fully retired, although I'm not sure about that after the conversation I've just had with him. So we are very grateful that he joins us this evening. Now, I'm sure like me, you're very keen to get started. So let me hand over to Nadia to begin her presentation. Thank you, Nadia. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Fiona. <laughs> Uh, I'm really delighted to be here today, surrounded by my family and my university family and all my friends. 
Uh, and thank you for coming. Uh, the weather is really bad, I got wet on the way, so I very much appreciate it. Um, my presentation is about decision making. And I wish I could tell you that I'm a rational decision maker who wanted to become an academic and devised a robust plan to achieve this. It did not happen this way. Let me tell you a bit more about my personal journey. Uh, my background is in computer science, and I came to the UK to study information systems. And at the end of a master's program, uh, my MSc supervisor, Simon French, offered me a job. It happened by chance. Uh, and uh, I went on to work on a European project. It was a great job because it took me to many places in Europe, Germany, France, um, uh, Ukraine, Russia, Hungary. And the aim of the project was to develop a decision support system to help politicians and health officials to take a decision in the event of a radiation accident. Remember Chernobyl? Well, some of you might have vivid memories. Some others were not even born in 1986 uh, uh, when uh, it happened. And, uh, you know, this part of the project was to develop tools to help politicians if any, any kind of radiation accident was to happen again. And the trip to Ukraine, because that was part of the project, was very memorable to me. What I remember from Ukraine and Chernobyl, cold. It was very, very cold. Uh, uh, freezing cold, but at the same time, the people there were very, very warm. And the community of researchers was even warmer. And I remember the trip, it was a coach trip from Kiev to Chernobyl. And we went through the security control. Um, and then we were approaching, uh, as we were approaching the uh, uh, the, the Chernobyl uh, reactor, just looked around me and everything was abandoned. Because, of course, the people who were living in the vicinity of the nuclear plant, they had to be evacuated. They thought they were going to return, but they never did. Uh, but I also remember, I have this memory, there was this tree and it was red. And I realized that when you have events like a radiation accident, even the environment, a very important stakeholder, is suffering. Um, uh, but that was really a long lasting lesson for me because after that I thought, you know something, what I'm doing is very, very important because I'm trying to develop tools to help people to tackle very, very difficult, but very important decisions. Um, and, uh, uh, over here, you can really find a, a few more details about the Rhodes project. And what I'm going to do in this presentation today is I have included these uh, QR codes uh, over here. So if you want to find out a bit more about any of the projects that have been involved in, you can really use your mobile phones or your iPads in order really to follow the link. But something that I wanted to highlight about this project was about my side, my task in this project. At that the time, and we're talking about 20 plus years ago, I was trying to combine decision analysis with artificial intelligence techniques in order to develop this kind of tools. And I know that, you know, I have put over here a definition of artificial intelligence. And um, I know that the minute you put the definition, people might disagree. But for me, artificial intelligence is an umbrella term. And AI tools are computer systems or digital tools uh, that perform a task. And if this task was to be performed by a human being, it would be considered to be intelligent. At the time, you know, you know, we did not really talk about uh, big data, uh, but still, you know, just uh, many of us, we were applying uh, AI methodologies. In this particular project, uh, I used decision analysis techniques in order to do the ranking of alternatives. And in this context, an alternative is uh, to, uh, uh, to, for example, to evacuate an area or to shelter another area. Uh, uh, but also what I did was I used constraint satisfaction programming to help generate different alternatives for the decision makers to consider. And then at the end, 
I developed an explanatory tool in order to explain and justify the recommendation of the system. So that was really more or less uh, what many of us were doing at the time. We were using AI in order to complement other techniques. And, and that was always in a decision analysis uh, context. Um, but I would like really to send some messages with my presentation uh, today. Um, of course, you know, process really matters. And when we design decision support tools, we have really to think very carefully about the process we follow and, you know, at which stages we, uh, you know, just will provide decision support. Explanatory tools, this is really very close to my heart, very important to me. But I would like really to highlight how important it is to be part of a network. Difficult problems have difficult solutions. You cannot really provide a simplistic solution to a wicked problem like a pandemic or a radiation accident. And what you need is to have access to a network of multidisciplinary researchers that spans across geographical boundaries. If there is a crisis in a country, you need to be able to use your phone or, you know, contact the person in another country and say, can we share data? Can we exchange ideas how to solve this problem? So that's very, very important to me. And, and after the Rhodes project, I got this habit. I wanted to really, I went into organizational decision making. I became part of the business school. And uh, it, this became like something like a pet project to me uh, to find out the good, the bad, and the ugly of decision making in different organizational settings. And so a pet project that I have is that I collect different uh, consultancy reports um, where consultants and companies have done a lot of research to find out how people take decisions and what they think about it. So as you can see here, many managers, they feel that, you know, decision making in their organizations is ineffective. But I would like to draw your attention to this report by McKinsey um, uh, over here in 2009. They said that it's very difficult to take decisions. Challenge number one, it's very difficult to make predictions. Challenge number two, people take a decision, but then execution is very problematic. And challenge number uh, uh, three, very often senior managers, they set unattainable goals or they don't insensitize you know, their staff uh, well enough. So decision making is very, very challenging. And well, then what do I do next? I go together with a team from British Telecom and I developed a framework for assessing quality in decision making. At the time, British Telecom I was going through a phase where they had decided to invest uh, billions of pounds in a new project and they wanted to set up a new network. Uh, and that was a strategic decision that triggered Tactical decisions, for example, they had to hire more people, they had to choose which geographic areas to prioritize in order uh, to, to build uh, the new network. And that also led to operational decisions. And these are day-to-day -day decisions, for example, if there was a problem, which, uh, um, um, which employee I'm going to send to fix the problem. And... Um, what I did, you know, just being a decision analyst, or, you know, a decision scientist, I tried to break it down into uh, smaller problems. So I tried really to identify what really matters when it comes to decision making and how to assess quality. Uh, so I took interviews, I did a literature review. And of course, you know, just if you, if you open any kind of textbook on decision making, it says that a well-informed decision is more likely to result in a high quality kind of uh, decision. So the more information we collect, the better it is. But something else I found out is, something that really matters is how you manage the process. Uh, who is involved in the process? How do you, do, you know, compile the decision-making body? And before the project, I thought, in every setting, there is a decision-maker who know who takes decisions. And then I realized that there are many places out there where they have meetings to decide who is going to decide. Uh, and it's not clear who is responsible, who is going to authorize the decision, who is going to approve it. Um, 
Um, another uh, factor that is very, very, it was very, very important at the time, it was efficiency. And that, that was something uh, in uh, British Telecom uh, uh, as well. They were placed in a lot of value to efficiency. And when I use the term efficiency, I mean well, how much time resources you allocate to a decision. And uh, I'm, when I took interviews, people told me, you know, you don't really want a prolonged decision, but you don't really want to blink. You have really to get it exactly right. But then, you know, I was reading more about some stories about companies, about acquisitions where a CEO would uh, decide to acquire a software company. Uh, everyone was saying, oh, this is a disastrous decision. The CEO would lose the job. And then another CEO would not undo the decision, but suddenly everyone would say, oh, this is a successful decision. And that made me think there is an underlying time dimension here. When it comes to success in decision-making, yes, it's very difficult to define it, but also there's the time dimension. Uh, when do, do, do we assess success? Is it immediately after uh, a decision? Is it five days, five months, five years afterwards? Because this can really make uh, the difference. And... Um, I, you know, just uh, uh, while, you know, just I was doing uh, this project, uh, you know, three of us, the three musketeers, we decided to write a book on decision behavior analysis support. And this is really a milestone in my career. Uh, the title defines very well what I do. I develop tools uh, in order uh, uh, to help uh, people to take better decisions, but I draw from all these uh, three areas. And the key message of the book is that if we want really to devise decision uh, systems, we have really to take into account how people actually take decisions. We cannot just uh, devise fancy mathematical models uh, to achieve uh, that. Uh, so prescriptive solutions are very, very important. And we talk, uh, of course, in the book a lot about decision analytics uh, approaches and methods. But around that time, uh, and we're talking about 10, 12 years ago, people then started to talk about big data, analytics. And analytics is really an algorithm uh, that, you know, performs a, a task. Uh, and, uh, and then, you know, just uh, slowly but steadily, I could, I could see a, a shift. And many people now, they are afraid of losing their jobs because of AI. I can tell you back then, I was talking to managers and they were very worried about their jobs because they thought, oh, you know, now with big data, if everything can be visualized, who is going to need us? Maybe, you know, by pressing a button, uh, you, you, you know, just a decision will be made. And so then, you know, just uh, that, uh, that uh, really changed, L opened the door to many projects. Uh, so many companies and many managers would come uh, uh, to the business school and they would tell me, Nandia, you know, there's something about AI. I know that it's very important. I don't know how to do this uh, in my company. And I really need someone to come and develop decision support and AI tools because I don't really want my competitors to be fast. Whatever this the wave is, I want to be on it. And... Um, um, I, I started a couple of uh, knowledge transfer partnership projects. Uh, this one is, uh, uh, that was with uh, Ian Miles, uh, with uh, DWF, and they really, they really wanted to improve internal capabilities. They wanted really uh, to improve performance uh, when it came to their uh, lawyers, because when, when you're a lawyer, you get a legal case and you have to decide, am I going to settle it or am I going to go to court? And what is the optimal time? Am I going to wait? Um, uh, uh, and uh, we develop tools in order really to help them uh, to achieve uh, that. But again, if you want to find out a bit more about this project, you can use the QR uh, code. Uh, and then, you know, that led to another large uh, knowledge transfer partnership project. And um, uh, the idea with this is so we're looking at customer journeys. And we want to enhance them by looking at the psychological and behavioral profiles of different customers. And the ultimate goal is to develop a Tinder app for lawyers. Now, I have to say I went out of my way today to give you definitions. Do you need to say what Tinder is? Or 
Okay, yep, a knowledgeable audience. Um, uh, but this is really the key message I want to really uh, to convey today. These are my own key learnings from these kind of projects. Uh, number one, auditing. When I go to a company, what I'm trying really to do is I'm trying to figure out what kind of data they have. And for example, in legal services firms, they have structured and structured data. They have a lot of data. Sometimes they don't know what to do with it. They, they want to provide a value-added service to the, the clients, but they want really someone to uh, come up with ideas. But something that is also very important is to look at the decision they want to improve. What is the underlying decision-making process? And what is the overall strategy of the company? Because if they want, if, if uh, uh, cost and efficiency is very important to them, you're looking at decision-making tasks that you can automate. Stakeholder engagement. This is very, very important. Uh, because you, when you are a decision support system developer, you kind of think that you are going to spend two years, develop a tool, and people are going to love it. But it's not working that way. Uh, you have to engage with the people who are going to use the technology because they need time and space in order uh, to, to use it. And if they think that they're going to lose their job or they're going to be undermined, they're not going to use it at all. So it's very important early on to identify this kind of uh, people who are going to promote you know, just the project, that they're going to sell the project within the company. Adaptability. Um, KTP projects, they're not like EPSSC projects. Uh, the, the, the company, they want to see that you make progress uh, with this kind of project. And also you might have to adapt because sometimes with AI tools, uh, you might think, oh, I have a lot of data. Surely I can achieve something here. And then you realize that you can't really do very much and you have really to change your plans and perhaps to adopt a rule-based system that you do not really want to do this in uh, the first place but you really need to be able to adapt. And once you are uh, involved in the project, you have to think, when I stop, when I complete, and I get out of the company, who is going to take over? Who is going to continue feeding data to the system uh, I have developed? Data management. Uh, whenever I have any kind of AI decision support project, I always want to get people who have database skills. You start with an AI project, you make progress with the database project because there's so much data that needs cleaning and management. And then you end up with a people focus kind of project. Uh, data ethics. Oh, I'd love it if, if uh, all if we were able to develop anonymization capabilities in companies. Life, you know, we would have had so many more projects within uh, the business school. Uh, but this is really an obstacle when it comes to projects with companies because they have a lot of data, but it's not as if they can hand over the data uh, to our researchers. Um, and finally, um, you know, when we develop uh, tools, there is a difference between developing an AI tool to play chess and the difference, you know, when you develop an AI tool that you want to embed it into a company's decision-making processes. When it comes to decision-making, there is a lot of uh, messiness, there is a lot of fuzziness, and you have really to embrace it. So it's not that easy. And be prepared because you might fail. Um, I, I'm, um, I'm, I'm very glad to be part of the uh, Turing uh, Institute. Many of my colleagues, uh, they're also Turing Fellows. And this is a report that has just been published. And you can use again the QR code in order to download it. And uh, uh, it was a panel of 4,000 uh, UK, uh, UK members of the public, a, a representative uh, sample, and they wanted to find out what they thought of different uses of AI technologies. So over here, you know, you can see there was a question to what extent do you think that the use of this technology would be beneficial? And they also asked to what extent do you think the use of this technology would be concerning? And when it came to health-related kind of decisions, uh, having an AI tool uh, to, uh, to help a doctor, you know, to provide advice when it came to risk assessment, this is something that people quite liked. They were favorable. But at the other end of the spectrum, they did not really like the use of robotics in autonomous weapons 
or the use of robotics uh, uh, and other technologies in driveless cars. Um, when it came, for example, to targeted advertising uh, for political reasons or for shopping reasons, consumer reasons, they did not really like uh, that as well. They found them very intrusive. Um, but what uh, um, uh, there's a lot of information that you can find in the report. What was intriguing for me was that there was not a uniform view of the use of AI in the UK. Uh, because when it comes to perception of AI, many things matter. Uh, for example, context. Facial recognition for uh, policing uh, is perceived in a different way compared to facial, the use of facial recognition for border control. People have different perceptions how the technology is being used. If uh, demographics, uh, the older you are, the more likely uh, you are to believe that we need to regulate AI. Individual characteristics, people, for example, who are knowledgeable about facial recognition, they're less likely to say, yes, I like this kind of technology. And then when it comes to explainability, which is uh, uh, something uh, very close uh, to my interest, um, I, I was pleased to see uh, that uh, only one in 10 said that accuracy is more important than uh, explainability. And I have to, say, to tell you here that very, very often when you have an AI tool, you might have a decision tree or a deep learning application. A decision tree is more transparent. It's more likely, you know, to, to, to explain, you know, just uh, a recommendation. A deep learning application, more, you know, if you have the data, you're more likely to get accurate results, but then it's more opaque. But people said, when we get a recommendation, we need to have some explanations. And this is something that they really, really uh, value. Um, so um, I'm going to go over some uh, slides just really to give you some ideas about the things that I'm doing. Uh, 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 just um, uh, as I said before, explanatory tools are very important in my view. Um, as an academic, when I take decisions about my students, uh, for example, it might be uh, the outcome of a PhD viva, it might be even uh, marking. I need really to look at them and justify my decision to them. And they need to have this kind of clarity inside me. At the same time, when we have an AI tool that gives a recommendation, the AI tool needs really to justify that recommendation. Uh, uh, or, or at least to say, you know, if someone did not really get a loan, what they could have done in order to get a loan, uh, as an example. And um, I, just part of maturing fellowship is to try really uh, uh, to, uh, to look at settings where you have a decision maker interacting with decision model that are trying to build either a probabilistic graphical model or a multi-criteria decision analysis uh, model. And then uh, uh, usually they do this with the help of a facilitator or a decision analyst. But what happens in settings where we don't really have uh, a decision analyst because of information security concerns, for example, can we develop dialogue systems in order to, to achieve that? And finally, you know, just uh, I uh, I am one of uh, the ethics research ethics coordinators in uh, in the school. I, I have recently joined the panel, the ethics panel of the Turing Institute, uh, and AI ethics is something that uh, I care about. And uh, I've recently um, uh, developed a, 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 and uh, worked on a, on a project funded by the Turing Institute. I had some wonderful collaborators from the NHS and America, and we developed an online uh, course in order really to introduce uh, health practitioners into uh, AI responsibility kind of concepts and what kind of ethical dilemmas they might be faced uh, with. And you can use again the QR code for that. Now, when I wrote the abstract for this presentation, I promised to say what is going to happen in the future. And um, when it came to the slide, what did I do? Well, I used chat GPT, of course. And you can see, you can see, you know, just uh, chat GPT uh, did a very good job, you know, just uh, predicting uh, what is going to happen in the future. But this is my side. And this is, you know, just you came here, you know, just to listen to what I think. Um, and I believe 
and many other people believe, believe this because so many of us uh, we use chat gpt uh, but people get used to this and they're going to expand this kind of interaction when it comes to interacting with this decision support tools but at the same time everything will be linked and has to be linked to you know to individual characteristics people will expect personalized recommendations but also they are going to expect personalized experiences uh, for example when it comes to gathering information are we going to have a meta serve uh, metaverse kind of platform augmented reality virtual reality human in the loop that's very very important uh, and in the last hearing report many people said yes we perceive ai in a favorable way for example in a health setting but we want a human being to take a decision uh, uh, for us. Ethical issues, as we link to big data and you know just databases, sustainability considerations. But we are going to see this uh, um, AI. Um, we have many uh, applications because many people out there they want to improve speed efficiency. But at the same time, we see that people say yes, but who is going to be accountable if things go wrong? So if I was to rewrite the book, uh, what would I say? If I had the crystal ball, what would I say? Well, if I'm honest with you, I don't expect an Armageddon kind of future scenario. And uh, uh, many people, you know, just on the radio and on TV, they describe a kind of existence where uh, we won't be able to live on planet Earth and uh, we're going to have AI entities taking over. Something that I want to stress is that still, you know, just we have not really passed the point of no return. The technology is evolving and it's up to us really to, uh, to introduce regulations and it's up to us to really determine what kind of future we want, how we want to coexist uh, with uh, AI. And I'm very fortunate to be um, part of the Decision Cognitive uh, uh, Sciences uh, Center here. I'm part of the Decision Analysis Group of the ORSOS, of the UK R Society, the Decision Analysis Society in the US, the Multicreative Decision Making Section. And maybe in these kind of communities, not all of us, maybe we are not the domain exper experts in radiation accidents, climate change, but we are process experts we can help others to visualize what kind of future they want and how they can devise a robust plan in order to get there and i'm going to finish uh, um, uh, with this um, uh, slide uh, you might recall that was a flight from uh, new york uh, you might have watched uh, the the film with tom hanks scully uh, th that was a scenario where a pilot Shortly after the takeoff, he lost the power of both engines. Um, and then, you know, it was in New York and uh, he looked around him. And most pilots in this kind of scenario, what they do is they try to figure out, is there an area that is not very well populated? Maybe I'm going to crash there. But he didn't. What he did was um, he took a few seconds and he looked around him. And he saw the river Hudson and he thought, you know, this looks like a runaway. Uh, and um, um, he was an exemplar decision maker because people uh, afterwards, they found out that he was a glider. He was taking lessons on crisis management. Uh, it, just He did many right things. He used contextual information on the day. And they've told him, you know, you are a hero. Uh, you are a hero. Uh, and he said, no, no, I'm not a hero. What I've done all my life is every day I've been trying to make a deposit to my bank of experience. And what happened that day, I had to make a huge withdrawal. So I very much hope that by coming to this uh, presentation today, all of us, including myself, we have made a small deposit to our own banks of experience because we might need it. Thank you.
Thank I you, Nadia. Can, yeah. That was fantastic. Really interesting. So, I'm sure there were lots of questions. Anyone from the audience want to start? Thank you. Um, one question I had was looking at the way machines think and the way humans think, do we run the risk of anthropomorphizing the way that machines think? And considering that we're quite reliant on interfaces like chat GPT and conversational interfaces, are we sort of failing to recreate human intelligence rather than exploiting the advantages that machine intelligences have? And should we be looking to maybe work with rather than trying to recreate human intelligence? When it comes to AI, there are two uh, paradigms. The one is you, you try to make the brain or uh, uh, you try to build the brain. And it is true that what we're trying to do now is to make a brain. We are trying really to develop algorithms uh, that perform tasks that appear to be intelligent. But it is true that, as you're saying, we're not trying to build the brain. And there are projects around that they're trying to do that. But something that we have to think about is what is the end game? What is the purpose? What are we going to gain uh, by uh, if we develop uh, machines that can think? Uh, and can we achieve that? I, I think for me, this is uh, a scenario that might materialize, but we are not there yet. Well, perhaps I could yeah. ask a rider to that. And it may indicate that I'm a Luddite of decision mm -hmm. analysis mm -hmm. from the last century. Mm -hmm. um, but looking at AI then, and now I look at mm -hmm. it from a much greater distance, it seems to me it's still mimicking rather than replicating intelligence. Yeah. Okay. So. I, 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 I remember that I, when I started teaching decision analysis, um, I, I had a demo and it was someone at the time, and that we're talking about 15 years ago, who had developed an AI system uh, and the AI system could paint. He was a very good painter, but he wanted to develop a system that would paint. Something that is commonplace now, you know, just we have many, many apps. At the time, we did not really have uh, uh, that many. And uh, a journalist went and he said to him, um, is is uh, is uh, your tool? Is it creative? And the guy said, "You know something? No, it's not creative at all. I'm creative because I'm the one who developed the system. I'm the one who developed the algorithm. And the algorithm is the number of steps that you use in order to instruct a machine to do something. And right now, this is what we are trying to do. Uh, so, so there is an argument that." The developer is more creative than the artifact. Hello. Um, it, it, fascinating um, presentation. And it, it was, I was partly reminded because you started with Chernobyl. Um, I recently listened to a dramatization about the Fukushima disaster. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that described was they had planned and planned, but culturally it was just wrong. Mm -hmm. And it, your point about a culture that sits behind the uh, decision, whether in a company, and I've seen examples of bad culture, or if we look at how on earth the Russians and Vladimir Putin decided to invade uh, Ukraine, the, there, are, there are vast cultural differences. How can AI ever contemplate or codify culture? Uh, if... We might have different versions of AI in different countries. You know, this uh, might be possible because um, in different countries, we have um, different uh, habits, different priorities. Uh, so when we develop AI, we develop AI that can make our lives a bit easier. And in different countries, you know, just because of cultural differences, uh, people might end up really developing their own versions of AI. But you raised a very important issue, and this is the culture. Um, and when you design a decision-making process, it's very important to have this kind of trust and culture. Because when it came to Fukushima, we, not everyone had access to information. And at the time, even the prime minister had to land his helicopter on uh, the company that was managing the, the nuclear plant in order really to get a bit more information. And another thing that happened, of course, uh, with Fukushima was that uh, people had thought about uncertainties, but that was not a scenario they had 
thought before and have not really prepared before. And this is something nice that we can think about how, uh, as we go along, how we can develop resilience layers so that we can uh, develop mechanisms as a society in order really to, to, to cope with many different problems or many different crises. There's someone on this side of the room. So second row from the back, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you so much for the beautiful talk. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, two questions quite basically related to each other. So how do you distinguish between machine learning and basically AI? A lot of the discussion that we have equally applied to machine learning rather than AI. So how these two are different uh, from each other? And what is the consequence of that? The other one is that the literature distinguish between prediction task and uh, decision task. So uh, machine learning as a technology for automating predictions and the AI literature is moving towards um, automating decisions as well. So would you see a kind of intrinsic difference between uh, prediction task and decision task or the distinction between these two are simply has to do with the limitation of data and as we collect more data, we can move toward basically automating decisions as well. And I think that that, type, that line of literature is quite basically yeah. somehow related to the yeah. discussion that we had yeah. today. What is your view on that, please? Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, when it comes to, the, to definitions of AI, uh, many people, uh, they take, uh, you know, just uh, uh, th th that side of the argument. And they say that, strictly speaking, AI is when uh, you do machine learning, because then you have a learning uh, element. You know, you might have machine learning, deep learning, reinforcement learning, there is a learning element. And it's only when you have this kind of element that you can say that technology falls under the umbrella of AI. Uh, but when I talk to, to people in businesses, and there are many, you know, just you and me, we talk a lot to, to other managers, um, people might develop an Excel file or a statistical model, and they think that's AI. Uh, or uh, a rule-based system can be AI. Um, I adopted the definition uh, today, and in my view, when you have a rule-based system and you're trying to capture the expertise of a professional, that's an AI tool. But to do take care, you know, just your point that, uh, we, uh, that we can talk about definitions. To me, this is a semantic, uh, a semantic kind of uh, 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 argument. And... Uh, what I care about is when people come to me with problems, how am I going to solve their problems? It might be that they use a range of tools. Some of them might be AI tools. Some of them they might be something else. Does it matter? I think what it matters is to solve people's uh, problems. When it comes to the difference between prediction and decision, uh, very often we need really to have uh, tools with predictive capability in order to feed to a decision support tool. So in order to make a, a decision, uh, we need really to have predictions about uh, uh, the future. For example, with, with COVID, uh, you know, just an example, you know, there were many predictive models uh, about the spread of COVID or what would happen if we went into a lockdown, many predictions. And then the, all these predictions fed to uh, decision-making structures because the decision-makers, politicians, you know, they had to take all this into account in order to take a decision. Thank you. Jim, I know you've been collating questions from the web. Yeah, we've had a lot of questions. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, First would be, what are the chances of really regulating AI? And secondly, um, where can you draw the line for how far AI can be used in making decisions that implicate a high level of accountability? Uh, yes, when it comes uh, to regulation, we can't afford really to move forward without regulation. Uh, we, we, we need really to, uh, and this is really uh, ha happening uh, now. I, the interesting bit is in this uh, Turing report, uh, people said, yes, we want really to see some kind of regulation. Now, there is no agreement what kind of regulation we're going to have. For example, are we going to have independent bodies? Are we going to have standards? Are we going to have other structures where uh, citizens might be involved and decide how we want to use AI? Or are we going to have the government? Many people say that companies 
maybe they can regulate, uh, but many of us would disagree with that uh, uh, view. Um, uh, and uh, the second uh, part is accountability. I, 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 when it comes uh, to AI, there are two, two, two facets of AI. The one is replacement or augmentation. Uh, and I think that accountability is, is very, very important. It is going really to stop us from seeing many applications where we have a replacement. Because when, they, when, for example, someone uses a driverless car, for example, to take a taxi, or in another application, if things go wrong, you need to know who is accountable. Let me give you an example. You go to a hospital, and uh, the, uh, the doctor, the doctor uses an AI tool, and over relies on this AI tool to give a recommendation. Things go wrong, who, who is to blame? Is it the doctor who used uh, uh, the tool? Is it the, the hospital management team that allowed this kind of practice? Uh, is it the government that they never introduce any regulations about this? So, so all, these are all uh, things that we're debating about and we are thinking about. Uh, and my message is we have to be somehow proactive uh, because what we're doing now is we're trying really to follow what's going on out there. I think we had a question over there. Yeah, thank you, Nadia. That yeah. was really interesting. Um, all decision making involves some kind of emotion. So, mm. what is your opinion about how AI can deal with that? Uh, that's very, very important. Uh, uh, thank you uh, for, for this uh, question. And uh, in uh, the Tinder project that uh, uh, I'm doing uh, with Elisa, uh, this is something we are taking into account. How can we capture someone's emotional state? Because we feel that uh, this is very, very important. Uh, when it comes to decision making, emotions are very important. And uh, we've had cases where people were involved in traffic accidents. And the, the part of the brain that controlled emotions was damaged. And they were not, after that, they were not able to take decisions. Take these people to a supermarket and they have to make a choice. They can't. So we know that emotions play an integral part when it comes to decision making. And uh, th this is something that keeps me awake at night because, uh, and this is something I would like to pursue in the next few years. I'm very lucky to have some excellent uh, PhD students. And uh, uh, one of them is uh, in the room uh, today. And what they're, they're trying to do is to find the role of emotions when it comes to dialogue systems, uh, when it comes uh, to using robots or chatbots or health assistance in a health setting. There's one question there and then we'll come over there. Nadia, hi. I want to just echo what everybody said. It's been a fantastic presentation. Thank you very much for making all of this wonderful work so accessible to us. My question is in relation to decision-making support within the context of different organizational phases or characteristics. Mm -hmm. uh, developing de de decision support for ordered organizations is relatively straightforward. How does one go about approaching this for a complex adaptive system or an organization that's representative of a complex adaptive system with many moving parts with a multiplicity of cultures, multiplicity of requirements, and constantly changing priorities. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, my approach is that you cannot really solve and fix everything in one go. And you have really to have an iteration uh, approach where you go to the organization. And the first question to ask is, what decisions really matter? What are the, the decisions uh, that are going to make a break or break the company? And then some of these decisions might be strategic. Some of these decisions might be operational because collectively uh, the value is very, very great. Uh, so once you have identified these crucial decisions, uh, then uh, you, you do your auditing. And we try to see who is involved in these decisions, how they're interacting with other tools or technologies, what they're trying to achieve. And then it might be uh, that you can identify an element of the process that you can improve. Uh, uh, or um, once you have fixed this, maybe you can automate some parts of the process, or maybe you can support uh, and you can provide comprehensive support throughout this particular process in the organization. Once you've done this, 
you have demonstrated to top management that you can make it, that you can really make a difference. And then slowly you can make these cultural change that you, by introducing decision support technologies, you can indeed make a difference. Uh, so thank you very much for the presentation. Mm -hmm. It was really good. The question is, how do you see AI, AI as a tool to address or increase global inequalities? And I'll give an example. Yeah, well, Greater yeah. Manchester Combined Authority has the resources and the technical capacities to come here to MBS yeah, and yeah. have you, but the local authority and do whatever AI for welfare, but the local authority in Brazil, interstate, doesn't have what yeah. will be the result of all this? Uh, this is a very important point we are, you're making because uh, we, we talk about AI, but we cannot really leave people behind. Um, when we talk about AI, we have the assumption that it operates on a mobile phone, on an iPad, or on a computer. How many people have access? Um, about I think it's about 5 million UK citizens who've never been online before. So by introducing all these AI tools, this is going to have an impact on them and their lives. Uh, so this is something that we have to take into account. We can't leave anyone behind. And we have really to devise robust plans. Uh, when it comes to this AI wave, what can we do in order to be inclusive? And what can we do to, to make the technology to be accessible to people? Jim, I think you've got some riders coming yeah, in. There's a question actually, almost exactly the same as that uh, come online, um, saying how can uh, AI possibly impact education and its reach, especially to those in isolated strata, geographically or socially? Yeah. So. Well, I have to say that uh, uh, most educators think that they're not going to be affected. Uh, the, many people are fear, fearful of their jobs, but it just at this moment in time, educators do not really seem to be afraid. And, and they're very creative. Um, uh, for example, ChatGPT, uh, there have been some fantastic presentations out there, how to use ChatGPT in, in an educational setting. For example, you can generate material and then you can get your students to say, do you agree with that? How you would have done things in a different way? Uh, there are so many wonderful AI applications, for example, augmented reality, virtual reality, and uh, in some other disciplines, for example, history. I would love to, to read about, uh, uh, for, for example, ancient Greece, and then by pressing the button, I would be transported uh, to the Acropolis in Athens, and I could see how it, it would look like. Uh, so I think AI right now, there are many... Uh, ways that we can use AI in order to enhance the experience of our students. Uh, at the same time, we have to be very careful because I know that many uh, educators are very concerned about chat GPT, of course, and how it can be used when it comes uh, uh, to assessment. But my attitude is we have to embrace it and we have to make it work for us. Thank you. I think there's one more there. Yes, thank you, Nadia, for this fantastic presentation. Actually, my question is about um, the slide about KTB, Project um, the lessons Learned from the, in terms of papers. And my question is, if you can give some explanation about how to embed it, or a difference yeah. between embed yeah. and deploy um, um, the technology when, in yeah. the end of the project. Yeah, so, so it was uh, the slide about the key learnings. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it, it has really, to, you have to work on this from day one. So you identify the process um, uh, that you want to improve, and then you try to figure out who is involved and how they interact with different technologies in order to take uh, decisions. Um, uh, and then we talk to them. It's very, very important to talk to people who eventually they're going to use this kind of uh, technology. And then you work alongside with them. Sometimes you are a co-designer. Sometimes, you know, they provide input uh, to, to what uh, um, uh, you, you want to, to, to do. The, the other bit that is very important is that when you try to embed AI tools into uh, components, it's very, very important to reassure people uh, you have to work with them. Um, I found that in the past that uh, um, many people um, 
they, they, they don't really want to, for example, to give data or, you know, you have to, you know, sometimes, you know, you have these awkward moments where you have to negotiate with people in order to get data, but it's all about planning. If you have a very well-defined plan and if you have top management to support you, yeah, then you can get there. You know, just you need, uh, you know, they need to send the signal uh, that this is a very important project for the organization. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then you, you, you have really, really, and this is why I said you start with a, a technology project, but you always end up with a people focused kind of project. Uh, because you have really to take into account all these socio technical yes, issues. Yes. Uh, and this, uh, some points that you hear from my books and the project in, in Malta for mm -hmm. uh, one of the companies, the national company, we try to adopt technology. Um, like ERP systems and that kind of So, what the point you mentioned there in terms of embedded technology system, um, you find some resistance from the mm. from the industries in terms of yeah, technology yeah, and working with technology for a long time in such way, and then yeah. when you try to adopt the new technology, yeah, you said some resistance. Uh, and in practical terms, just use newsletters, give yeah. presentations to people early yeah. on in the process. Yeah. Point you mentioned now is. Support from higher or government, yeah, yeah, to create a DSM that's new technology which is so important for their development because they're just working in development, so they it can be easier for people who are working in this project to put it down in this way. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank Thanks. you. Okay, I think we've got time for one more question. Thank you. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. And my question is uh, regarding machine learning and specifically about the data that is fed. And uh, one issue that I see emerging from that is what if the data is uh, biased? Mm -hmm. Like how it, it's probably on everyone's mind, but uh, how would that then affect this decision making? Uh, uh, yes, and this is uh, uh, in the book uh, we, we sign with. This is something that we say that we all fall when we take decisions. We all fall, you know, into decision making traps. And let me tell you a secret. Sometimes I find myself falling into a decision making trap. And, uh, you know, it's as if it is part of our, our DNA and we can't really help it. But all this data it's, that we generate as decision makers. All this data, they're really fed into machine learning algorithms. Uh, so yes, the bias is replicated and there is really no doubt about this. In, a, in a, my um, in the course that I have developed with the Turing Institute, we're trying to highlight all these issues in the healthcare uh, sector, because this is something very, very important. And we need really to educate people so that they understand the biases they fall into when it comes to using this kind of technologies. But also, um, uh, we are trying to uh, devise a number of guidelines for AI developers. What are the things they need to take into account when it comes, for example, to sampling um, data? Thank you. Thank you. So. Thank you very much. Yeah. So. Can I say a big thank you to Nadia for sharing her insights with us today and also to Simon for facilitating the discussion. Thank you as well for all of your very interesting questions and that also includes the online audience. I'm very glad that they could participate in the discussion today. So we have one more original thinking lecture in this academic year, which will be held on the 12th of July. That is going to be given by Professor Brahim Sadouni, who is from Accounting and Finance, who will be exploring initial public offerings and underwriters' compensation. So I do hope to see some of you there. But for now, thank you very much for joining us here in the room and online. Uh, for those of you who are in person, I hope that you can now uh, join us in the mill for a drink to celebrate Nadia's success in securing a professorship. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. Okay, thank you. Thank you for coming. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. That was really nicely described, you know. Right. All very lovely.